that video going. One second. We're told to grow at all costs. We're told to sell to everyone. Demand attention. And push our way to the top. We're told to not take no for an answer. We jump over and over. And never put the phone down. We're told to cut costs, increase margins, and bow to the bottom line. We're told to get in people's faces, force conversions, and make it hard to leave. We're told to grow at all costs. But I see a different way. I choose to grow better. I choose to help customers, not interrupt them. See relationships, not just deals. I choose to sell what people need, only when they need it. Solve for my customers, not just my quarter. I choose to focus on impact, not just revenue. Measure in loyalty, not leads. I choose to get rid of friction and seek out feedback up to my mistakes and get better every time. I choose to do the right thing. Even when it's hard. Stay true to my purpose and build a community. We're told to grow at all cost. I choose to grow back. So that was just uh, an opening. One of the things I'm going to share with you a little bit uh, as we go through today is actually um, a few of the insights from Inbound, which is the whole concept. It's a whole conference that happens uh, in Boston once a year. I was there two weeks ago. So I want to share some of the insights that we got from there. And that kind of opened the uh, three-day inbound conference, 26,000 digital marketers from around the global center on this one convention center in Boston. But how important it is for us to think about growing better or growing smarter, rather than getting into this frustration of just growing, you know, the, like the impact of growing. I think we could all feel that pain, if you like, of trying to keep up with what's happening. So in this session, I want to kind of share with you a, a, a whole bunch of ideas about how we can grow smarter, we can grow better, rather than just grow at all costs. So it's all about understanding and engaging with the new consumer. So we're going to touch on these new consumers. We're going to kind of think about how we can engage with the new consumers, how we're actually going to still remain relevant with our brand with the existing consumers today, um, and then put it all together to help us grow just that little bit smarter in our business over the next uh, few years as we go, go through. One of the important things I wanted to share with you, this, uh, this slide in terms of like where things are, are kind of heading. If, uh, if we kind of think about that as brands, we've got to think outside the square or maybe the rectangle. This is B uh, Buckmeister Fuller's knowledge curve. And you can kind of see that this is how we're growing in terms of our education and our knowledge. You know, in the first kind of from 1900, human knowledge just doubled approximately every century. So we're getting smarter like every 100 years. By 1945, we were doubling our smartness, if you like, every 25 years. We've now gone to this massive curve at the end, this kind of world we're living currently right here, right now. On average, the human knowledge is doubling every 13 months. So that's a challenge for us because we've got to constantly be ahead of the curve. There's new stuff happening. We go to bed at night, we wake up the next day, and there's something new that we need to, we think we need to learn, there's something new that we need to deliver to our customers, something new that we need to bring to our business. So we have to think about how do we prioritize? And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about narrowing our thinking a little bit as well, because this is only going to get worse. As you can see, that curve is just going. We're getting smarter and smarter for our own good and releasing technology so, so quickly that you know, something new becomes obsolete. 
um, pretty much overnight. This is also a slide I wanted to share. This is a couple of themes from Inbound that we had as well. This is kind of the world we're living in now. It's not just about customers wanting to connect. It's also about employees wanting to work in the same environment as customers, when, where, and how they want. So we're becoming this kind of flexible workforce, this kind of flexible customer journey, and we kind of have to think about how do we do it. So internally within our businesses, we need to be thinking about how flexible are our businesses. If we're still very old school, you know, very, um, you know, having very structured kind of approach, um, being, you know, having, having managers and directors, like all of that stuff is going to become very, very hard to attract new employees as we move into this next generation. Um, but also our customers want also to connect in this kind of flexible kind of way. So we need to be thinking about how can we keep our, our internal brand fluid, but also our customer service flexible. And these are the customers, of course, in a slide I've probably shown maybe three times now. My, I've got to change my slide. This, was my, this is my millennial slide I used to use where I used to say, wherever I'm presenting, there's some guy looking in going, hmm, what's going on in here? What's that guy talking about up there? But um, the interesting thing is I did mention with, to you guys before about you know, this generation stuff. And I, and I think it's just important for us to just take a moment and think about you know, the audience out there, you know, the, the world. If you're a global business, it's a global audience with different regions and different things. But at the Z generation, which I mentioned earlier on, I think when we launched the conference, 24% next year of the workforce are going to be Gen Zs. And according to Saatchi, Gen Z, 79%, 79% of Gen Z say they would engage with a brand that could help them make a difference. So that kind of changes the whole marketing landscape, doesn't it? How are you going to make your customers make a difference? Because that's kind of how we're trending. That's kind of what's happening. This is the next generation and what they want to see. Um, if we have a look at this, this is a fantastic, these guys, McCrindle out of Sydney, um, a great slide. I mean, you, you may be able to see if you take some pictures of it, but obviously we'll be sharing the slides in, in a couple of weeks. But I love this because it puts all of the kind of buyer personas, the different generations in one convenient looking slide. You go right back to the builders. And we talk about, you know, back in the builder's days, you know, that was the, the first kind of generation. They were driving Model T Fords. You know, that, that was their kind of car of choice. Roller skates was their toy. Record players was their music device. Um, and they were very much controlling leadership style, very formal learners. And uh, obviously print, traditional print, was their form of communication. We then go through the generations. And let's come right over to the Gen Alphas. These guys are only like nine years old right now. So probably not a target market for most people in the room, but let's have a look at how they compare to the builders, right? It's kind of like social makers are Trump and Brexit, they're going through all of this. The, the auto cars are gonna become part of their life very, very soon. Um, smart speakers instead of record players. They wanna co-create, they want to uh, have a virtual learning style rather than the traditional kind of learning style. And they want this real-time in situ type of marketing. So we've got to start thinking about how do we, you know, the builders are probably less uh, apparent to us now. The baby boomers are becoming, I think, 6% of our workforce will be the baby boomers as they move to retirement. But we really need to be looking at these three, the Gen Xs, the Gen Ys, the Gen Zs, and the, and the upcoming alphas. And I was talking to some guys in the break at lunchtime. I think as brands, we need to think about who are our best fit audience, our best fit customers now, but then equally, maybe 20% or so of our time needs to be thinking about what is our customers in the future. If we don't start planning for how our products and services are going to relate to the alphas 10 years from now, 20 or 15 years from now, whenever they enter the workforce, it's going to be a big shift for us. Like we need to start evolving and that flexibility comes back into how we market our businesses and run our businesses. Let's deep dive a little bit into those uh, gen alphas. They're about as old as the iPad out of interesting. So, you know, the iPad came out 2010, and this was the same year as our Gen Alphas came out. Three to four of them believe it's important to speak out about causes they believe in. So again, that changes the way, the landscape of how we're going to market our products. Are we, you know, we need to take a position on causes. Causes are becoming an, an important stuff um, in terms of subject matter for this kind of generation. They enjoy making things. They enjoy slime, <laughs> which is interesting. I don't know how we're going to make that work. But, um, but certainly you can see here, this, these digital masters, critical consumers of the future, is kind of like start thinking ahead. 
you know, it doesn't matter now they're nine years old unless you're a toy manufacturer, but you know, 10 years from now, these are going to be your customers. These are going to be the people entering the workforce. So what are we thinking about how we're going to market to these people in the near future? But right here, right now, what we need to be thinking about is, is how are customers buying from us today? You know, websites are changing. This is a website that we've created just recently. You can check this out. This is kind of what I believe is kind of the latest style of website. It's very much colourful, it's video, it's, it's kind of like um, lots of white space. But the interesting thing is, built into the back end of this website is a huge personalisation um, database and platform. The actual whole website is built on a platform called HubSpot, but it enables us to personalise the experience. So when someone comes to the site, they can actually, we can know just that little bit more about them. They can come in and this time we're going to like tr create it like it's actually an offer within the website. They want to come in, we want to straight away start that conversation with them on the website. So we're going to start asking them, you know, what is the solution that you need to find? In this case, they want to stop snoring and then automatically, like a database driven website, pull the relevant pages forward. Because people don't have time to try and navigate your kind of ecosystem of your website. We're going to make it easy, super easy for people. So start thinking about UX and UI on your websites. It's so important. Before you build a new website, even your current website from today, go back and, and test it. You know, go through a, a kind of a UX workshop or strategy session. We do a lot of that with clients to develop websites like this. And check out resmed.com.au and you'll see this new experience and some of the personalization that's happening. We've even got like a time thing in there. So if you happen to go to the site at night time because you can't sleep, it creates this kind of good evening kind of uh, feeling, like dimmer lighting type of feel. And if you go there during the day, it's brighter and happier. So all of a sudden, we've created a personalized experience from the very moment, the very first touch point. So websites are changing. Also, our interactive content's changing. I mentioned this yesterday, the uh, product called Seros, right? This is just one particular one. So what we've done is we've, we've poured the control of our online content and now given it in the hands of the most creative people in our organization, the design department. Now these guys aren't coders, so we don't want them to think about coding. So this product, it's an investment, it's, it's, it's a fairly big investment at the moment. I mean, they're still working their pricing model out because they've not been around for that long. But the whole idea is it's an interactive page. Instead of it being traditional, lots of content, it's animation, it's quizzes, it's things like that that interact with people. So you can see here, it's like very, very colorful. Things are moving, you, you can't see it in this particular slide, but you can see interactive content. We're putting statistic information in there that slides across the screen. We're asking them quiz questions. You know, answer a quiz and be part of a quiz. And then we're actually giving them this kind of like, yeah, interactive, very colorful stuff. And some of the results that this is actually, uh, we did one for a HR platform called Tiny Pulse and built one of these for them. It saw a bounce rate, just to give you some specifics here, a bounce rate of just 25.99%, right? Now to put that in perspective, the average, considered the average bounce rate is 41 to 55%. What's considered to be an excellent, excellent bounce rate is 26% and above. So this is above excellent for the fact that it's interactive. The average time on page was five minutes. So every, uh, we could tell that more people spent time because it was interactive and engaging. And that so far they had 86 new contacts since it launched back in March. So this is very much an awareness branded type of content. It's not a salesy type bottom of the funnel stuff. But this interactive stuff, and I mentioned before, we've got uh, sortedstone.com forward slash conversations. If you haven't checked that out yet, have a look at it. That's built on Seros. Um, and also just hit me up if you want any more examples of it. But certainly we're building a lot more of this interactive content because this is what people want. You know, the audience is telling us they want this, this easy to consume type of content, type of information rather than laborious long stuff. And if we look at one of the drivers for some of this, it's the mobile. If we look back to 2011, which it wasn't that far um, in the past, this is the top apps, you know, and what you can see from these apps back in 2011 was there was a lot of kind of gamification, fun type apps. You know, you can see the kind of mix. But if we fast forward to today, this is what the most popular apps look like on your mobile phone today. You know, 2019 gives us TikTok, which is uh, coming through if you haven't checked out Slack. A lot of people are using Slack as a communication tool more for business. But you can see most of these apps now on the phone are messaging apps. 
we've moved away from just playing these one-way um, kind of games and we started to communicate and use our phone not just to take calls but to also messages and as businesses we need to make it as easy for customers to message us through some of these messaging platforms and messenger of course with you know 1.67 whatever it is billion kind of users is one of those leaders um, and whatsapp as well is starting to come through in terms of like how people want to have that seamless frictionless connection with our business and that's what we need to start thinking about especially with this next generation coming through as you can see it just continues to rise as more and more messengers um, you know come through or conversations happen on messenger and then of course I mentioned a lot about this yesterday chatbots I'm not going to spend too much time on this in our masterclass yesterday we talked about chatbots but you know how easy is it to have a conversation with a chatbot the best thing is that we can lead on from a live chat to a chatbot from a chatbot to a live chat and one can hand over to the other. You've got to start thinking about how do you automate the conversation, you know, and, and, and understand that when people come to your website or a certain page, you know, the FAQs that used to be on a website are now being replaced by these things. The easiest thing you can do right now on your website is take the old style FAQ where people have to kind of search aimlessly for the right question and answer into a chatbot conversation. Take your FAQs and turn them into this kind of conversation. Uh, and you'll find the engagement will be, you know, so much, so much stronger. And if you're building one, think about this messaging framework. This is the inbound marketing kind of messaging framework, which works really, really well when you're developing this conversation through your websites and your social and through your business. If we start on the top left side, we have connect. We need to be available to solve the person's problem. All right, they're there for a reason. So if we've got, if we understand straight away, we want to connect and understand through um, a messaging app, engage with them on a conversational tone, understand as quickly as we can the reason they came to our site. You know, time is just such an important thing now. You know, there's this few seconds that you have to capture someone's attention in a busy world like that first video I showed you where everything's just happening so fast in our lives. How do we connect with people by identifying first a connection, a reason for them being, the problem that they have in our solution, how are we going to work those things together? You're then moving around the framework to understanding, designing a conversation with filtering questions. So you're asking more questions in a kind of a chat, conversational type of way. Understanding just that little bit more about unpacking what that problem is or the solution they're looking for. We then need to deliver the solution via rich media without forcing the user to leave the platform. One of the worst things you can do is if you're having a conversation on Messenger is take them off to a landing page on a website. Try and talk to them in their platform of choice. If they come to you via Instagram, if they come to you via Facebook, if they come to you via email or web, then continue the conversation on the platform that they came into you on. As soon as you move platforms, because that's how you set up, you're creating this friction between you and the customer. It's the same way as if I started talking to you today and then halfway through the conversation I said, let's just go, and go into another room. Okay, the conversation stops, it becomes a bit friction, you know, we're into a different environment. Like we need to think about having the conversation here and now, wherever it is, based on where the customer wants. We then need to refine it based on the user's interactions. We need to continue and optimize that conversational strategy. So we, used to, we need to this kind of machine learning, but also our own learning of what questions are being asked that we didn't answer, and then start adding more of those questions back in. And then connecting it ideally with a CRM so that it becomes even more contextual. So we know who the person's having the conversation with. We can then actually bring up relevant data and say, oh yeah, Harry, we know that you bought a product from us about a month ago. How's that going for you? I mean, all of a sudden, this relationship, this one-to-one -one becomes so, so strong. We need to really start thinking about stop being a kind of a message to an audience of many and start having these one-to-one -one experiences and conversations with our, our customers and our prospects.
this has um, been out for, who's seen that before? It's been out for, no one. It's been out for like a, a few years, but it's what Google would call the micro moments. And it's like such an important thing because you've got to think about context where your actual customers are right now and when they need you the most. Um, and one of the interesting things is if you think about it like in terms of like you want to buy tickets to say a baseball game, if you're searching for that thing on a Wednesday, you need to be bringing up content that's relevant to booking tickets for the game, looking forward to going to the game. But if it's on a Saturday and the game's on Saturday and you're searching the same thing as you were searching on Wednesday, it's now more about transportation, how do I get there, where am I going to go to eat, that kind of sort of stuff, not trying to sell me a ticket because it's too late, I should have bought that ticket on Wednesday. So we need to kind of start thinking broader about the context of where our customers are, not just who they are with a buyer persona, but the context of where our customers are. And this is, you know, companies, this again was shared at Inbound, but uh, this was an interesting one because it just shows how companies that are really getting this, you know, I mentioned before, it's not about what you sell, it's how you sell. The, the, a lot of these are American companies, so you have to excuse the kind of comparison here, but certainly things like iTunes are now moving more into Spotify. The old yellow cabs of New York are starting to move into Lyft, is becoming a lot more popular over there. You know, Sealy, which is uh, you know, obviously a bed manufacturer, a bed retailer, is now moving into this Casper. And from what I understand about Casper is you actually get to try the bed. The bed comes to you, you try the bed and the mattress, you can have it for, I don't know what it is, 14 days, 30 days, if you're not happy, you send it back. And then try another mattress. Like this is, this is the kind of world that we're starting to move into. This kind of try for free, frictionless purchasing, rather than pay up front, whether you like it or not, you know, you're still gonna have it. And these are some of the brands that are kind of really getting this new world, this new consumer, this new way of selling. And we need to kind of start thinking about that as well, like these guys. Dollar, and we also make fine colognes club. Dollar, and now amazing deodorant too club. Dollar, that's right, even toothbrushes and toothpaste club. Dollar, oh yes, luxuriate in that body wash baby club. Dollar bath jerky club? Not yet, but good idea. Dollar Shave Club makes finding top shelf grooming products super easy because we always want you to look, feel, and smell your best. Check out the new Dollar Shave Club at the old URL, dollarshaveclub.com. Who's heard of Dollar Shave Club? Yeah? If you, um, I, w I actually was on a, on a flight back from the US and I actually watched uh, a series about the, um, you know, the entrepreneur behind it and the growth of those guys. These guys were, were like a startup. Um, they just had this, this idea that they looked at friction in purchasing a shaver. In America, you have to, uh, because of the blades and the rules, you have to actually get someone to unlock the cabinet for you to actually take out and look at it. So, you know, you've got to find someone first before you can even try the blade. With this is you pay $1 for the first month, then I think it's $9 a month after that, and they send you a new blade and a whole bunch of products and stuff whenever you need them. Um, it's very narrow. They focused on one thing. They've started to broaden like a lot of their products, but it's still around one key thing. These guys sold recently, I think it was last year, for a billion dollars to Unilever. Like a startup that started around selling shavers became a $1 billion kind of success story. So we need to start thinking about, like, and what I liked about that is how they market themselves. It's a bit funny, it's a bit comical, and I think even with our kind of our content that we're putting out there, we need to stop thinking about it being 800 word, educational, SEO driven kind of blog posts. You know, we've got to think about light touch. Um, more in exciting, engaging type of content. Have a bit of fun with the content. Be a bit creative with the content. And you'll find that you will get a lot more engagement than just someone having to read through a blog post to actually get the content that you want to deliver. So how do we plan for this? I want to share with you some tools to kind of like that we use with our clients when we do strategy sessions, right? So one of the important things to do, and this is what you should do with your teams, um, or if you're a marketing agency, do it with your clients, is start planning out. Like what are the things that are impacting on us right now? So just three things. I think sometimes we can get burdened down with the SWOT analysis, you know, the strengths, the weaknesses, the threats, and it can become overwhelming. But what are the three things that are likely to happen? to our business right now? What are the three things impacting us? So some of the things I'm telling you today may not even affect you right now. They might affect you later on, but there might be three things that are really impacting on your business right now. What are those three things? What can you do about it? As a team, you need to brainstorm. Okay, these are our three 
you know, impacts. It could be positive and negative. They could be opportunities that you need to capture in new markets and new environments, or they could be, you know, pressures from new competitors or pricing, whatever it might be. What can you do about it? And the important thing is this last one, is what are the implications to the business if you do or don't do something about it? Because that's the motivating factor. That just targets you and focuses you on that. The other thing to do is this one called the competitor metrics. And this is like just getting everybody in your team individually to plot where they feel the competition is right now in terms of this quadrant. So we have the top right quadrant, high price, high quality. And this is the perception they have in the market, by the way. You may know stuff about your competitors because you're in the, the, the kind of the industry that they're in. But this is how you, you, your kind of audience, your market is perceiving them. Do they perceive them in this top quadrant? Do they perceive them in the low quadrant or in these other two quadrants here? Once you get your team to do that, then also get your team individually to then plot where you are right now. Where do they think you fit in that matrix? And then all of you come together and combine them together. And it's interesting when you find individuals within your team where they feel competitors sit, it becomes a discussion point, but more importantly, where they think you sit right now. I want you to find, okay, this is where we sit. Everybody collectively says we're right on the middle there, for example. The last part of this exercise is then to say, where do we want to be? Where do we need to be two, three, four, five years from now? And then that becomes your kind of like very high level strategy. You may find, for example, that all your competitors and you are in this high price, high quality quadrant. So what that tells you is there's, a, there's this thing called um, blue ocean strategy. Red ocean means everybody's in there together or playing in the same kind of pool, if you like. Blue ocean strategy is moving away, moving into something different. So you might decide, we're going to do a quality product, but we're going to do a light touch. We're going to create the light version of it and play in this bottom right qu quadrant where the, the, the air is cleaner. There's less people in there, less competitors in there. So this is an interesting one to kind of plan out without doing a business plan. It's more of a high level thing. And you can do like Cirque du Soleil did where they, they looked at the, um, the, you know, the circus market. They were in the traditional circus market and they thought, this is not going anywhere. You know, animals and clowns and people like that. And they, they did some research and they found that, you know, one of the biggest more kind of uh, less competitive markets was the more the entertainment where people would actually pay money to, to, to go along to, you know, kind of like a, a, a theatre style or a feature style kind of experience. And then they took away the animals and, you know, Circus de Soleil became like a, this big success story because they looked at the blue ocean area of where they could actually take their circus concept. If we simplify the buyer journey down to this, it's really the awareness, the consideration and the decision stage. No matter how complicated things get, people still go through these three and we've touched upon it in different presentations through these last two days, but people do go through this awareness. They, they have an awareness part and we need to somehow create content and engage with people at the awareness stage. They're so far from ready to buy, but we need to get them in the funnel. We need to get them into our ecosystem and just feed them with content that they want to make their decision and gradually move down the funnel to consideration and then decision stage. And that's when we reach out to them and start talking about our products, our solutions and everything else like that. We need to map it out. This is a typical buyer journey that we mapped out for a client. And this is something again to do where you can see like, it looks quite complicated, but the whole concept here is we, we did this for ResMed India where we actually went through the whole buyer journey of how we're actually gonna um, connect with our consumers from the awareness stage right at the very front through Facebook, Google ads, blogs, how we're then going to bring people down. So how are we going to nurture them? How are we going to kind of workflow them into the next level? So we're going to workflow them into a sleep quiz or a SARA, which is an app on your phone that kind of measures your sleep score, uh, listens to you during the night and then gives you a kind of a recommendation at the end. So we're going to drive everything down to here and then from there we're going to take them to a sleep in education interactive page to educate them on the importance of sleep. And then we're going to go further down the funnel, and then we're going to bring them down here. Um, as you can see, there's timelines down the left-hand side. There's um, some key measures that we want to kind of accomplish. What's our conversion rates going to be? And at the end of it, we want to just become these customers that buy from us, rent from us, or go onto a subscription model. So our, our three kind of areas to make it easy for people to purchase from us. But then from there, we want to make them brand ambassadors. And that's the next thing that you build out, which is what we call the delight stage. So we need to kind of really deep dive into how do you build out this whole buyer journey. It's not just about buy from us now. It's not just about get our brand out there. It's about this whole, this whole ecosystem that we're creating so our buyers seamlessly go from kind of one step to the next. 
So I've got a little bit of a challenge for you. You guys ready? Because I think it's, um, we've got a bit of time today. Let's see how we're going for time. We're good. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually build out a kind of fictitious buyer journey, right? Awareness, consideration, and decision. Everyone understand that? Yeah. OK. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief in a second. And then I'm just going to, and this is only just b before we get too interactive and you think it's going to be another one of those full-on sessions. It's only 10 minutes. That's all I'm going to take from your time, 10 minutes. But I think it's going to be a useful exercise. So I'll give you the brief first. So the brief is we have Josh and Sasha, right? They're both millennials. They're both full-time workers. You know, they've got a decent kind of income together, no children. They're just working hard. You know, typical kind of, you know, two income professionals, Josh and Sasha. And then our product for this um, kind of brief. Our product is this wonderful Daytona Spa, right? So this is that lovely spa, high level, high quality. This is the stuff where you go, you detox, you have your massages, your spa treatments. It's really nice, right? And you've got to travel to this because this is in a lovely part of the world, but not exactly where Josh and, and um, Sasha are. So the brief is, how do we get Josh and Sasha to the Daytona Spa, okay? And the way we're going to do it is we're going to think about the three different areas that we've got. So awareness, right, we're very much top of the funnel. How does, what, what are we going to do in terms of engagement? What are our engagement ideas? And I want you to be as creative as you can. Just kind of think about how we're going to engage with Josh and Sasha without selling the Daytona Spa, but to get them interested in it. What kind of things would you be doing at the very top of the funnel to get them aware, to get them aware of this opportunity? Then the middle of the funnel is consideration. So this is now where we need to start having them think about options like do we, do we go for the, you know, they need to start thinking about not actually this particular thing but uh, options for a holiday, options for health, like think about everything that the health spa kind of stands for. And then the last thing is one step away from actually booking. How do we get them to experience the Daytona spa without actually going there? How can we give them a taste? How can we give them a teaser? to do it. So they're the three key stages. To give you a help, and again, I'm sorry this slide looks uh, kind of fairly crazy, but these are some of the ideas, right? So you've got awareness, you've got emotional and rational. These are the type of things that we can use to kind of build those trigger points along the buyer journey. So we've got awareness stuff. So we can have photos, quizzes, surveys, um, virals, articles, things like that that are very much at that awareness level to kind of get them interested, get them aware of our day spa. The rational stuff is things like podcast infographics, so things that you know, could be educating them about the importance of health for millennials. It could be anything that we want to kind of like educate them that will actually get them then CTA with a call to action back into the next stage of the journey. The research or the kind of the middle of the funnel stuff is things where we might start doing, you know, branded videos like to tease them. It might be an e-book. Um, we might have some, you know, PR, you know, templates. In, in this case, probably not going to have anything they can download. Maybe there is something they can download. You know, but what, it, what is the thing in the middle of the funnel that's going to get them to consider the day spa, right? And then the last thing is this final thing, endorsements, case studies, people have already experienced it. Maybe there's another Josh and Sasha that have been there that they can relate to and go, wow, look at these guys, they look so fresh, they look so well. How do we become like them? Um, community forums, maybe there's a community that's set up for this day spa that everyone's saying about, you know, that you're creating this tribal kind of thing. Um, demo videos, things like that. So this is pretty much the, the spectrum. Everyone kind of understand the brief? Do we understand the brief? Okay. So the brief is Josh and Sasha to the Daytona Spa. And this is how we're going to do it because we're only going to 10 minutes on this, maybe less. So I want this side of the room, you guys are awareness. So the only thing you're thinking about on this side of the room here is awareness. How do we, what, what creative ideas from the Daytona Spa can we attract? Just random ideas, think about it. But remember, you're not selling it. You're, not, you're just trying to get their kind of involvement, their interaction, okay? Middle of the room here, you guys are the middle of the funnel. So you guys are going to be the, the, the people that are ready to consider. So once these guys have got their attention, you guys are going to get them to consider. You're the MQLs, the middle, the marketing qualified lead. So what kind of things can you think about just in a quick brainstorm? And then my last part of the room over this side, you guys are the decision stage, right? Your guys one step away from them booking their air ticket and booking their $1,000 a night or whatever it is to go to this exclusive day spa. So how can you get them just that one step 
to saying, right, I'm ready to go. Everyone understand the brief? Yeah? yeah. Okay, all right, we're gonna have 10 minutes and the clock starts now. You can put the music up. Um. radius but maybe early bird or early bird discount or something like that if they
what makes you sorry for that girl? What makes you decide that you can go uh, for a spa? For a spa? If you book now, yeah. Okay, down to the last two minutes, guys. Think about now your one key offer, your one offer. Like if you've got a few different ideas, what is your best offer? We're going to be going from one to the other. What is your best offer? What one are you going to go with at awareness, consideration, decision? Folks, finish up one minute to go. One minute, your best offer, your best engagement piece. Narrow it down to one offer. I have to go. Good luck. Okay, we're ready on the cube. We're starting this side. All right, the last dying seconds. How did we go? Did everyone enjoy that? Yes? 
Well, we're going to find out exactly what you did in the next 10 seconds. So what I, what I want to do, we're going to make this super quick and exciting. We've got the, uh, the boom box, the catch box is ready to go. We're going to go, whoever wants to, you know, put your hand up. I'm going to start with awareness. We're just going to throw the box around. <laughs> Can we do that? Can we throw the box around? Or initially, you've got to run between them. We're going to throw the box from table to table for an awareness. Um, guys in the decision stage, your, your time's up. <laughs> This is, this is what happens, you know, like the awareness. We're all focused on the awareness. Considerations with us, the decision stage, they can't yeah. decide. <laughs> They're still trying to work it out. All right, so hands up. Who wants to go first? We want one idea from everybody for the awareness. Remember the brief. If we go back to our brief, we want awareness, consideration, decision. The brief is to get Josh and Sasha to the Daytona Spa, somewhere exotic location. It's a big expensive thing. They've got to book tickets and everything else. But how do we get them aware? Off we go. Who's first? Straight okay. into the box. Hello. Okay. So uh, for awareness. Uh, you speak, speak right into it. We won't, yeah. Okay. Sorry. For awareness, uh, no, three key things come to my mind. Uh, one is, uh, no, uh, they are professionals. Uh, obviously, they go to office. They are millennials. They are more excited. Their most preferable channel is mobile. And the second is what is their entire journey, right? So from uh, morning to evening, right? So what time of day they are available because they are, again they are professionals right so so that's how i'm going to plan uh, my awareness campaign i will start like their uh, no office location i will have some ad or banner ad over there regarding the spa and all that and then i will also think about some push notification through mobile and then during the transport right because they might be catching up through metro or no through no public transport so there if i can add or push some ads over there or banner ad and then in the locality uh, again there could be some uh, awareness around that as well okay who, who feels that that's awareness who feels that that would be a bit pushy or not do you think that that would be okay that we start pushing straight away at an awareness stage the benefits of the health spa? Is it more kind of middle of the funnel? More kind of, so, so I think that the idea is sound, but it's probably more down here. Like if, I, if we started to receive kind of push stuff trying to tell me about a spa that I know nothing about, that I'm not necessarily even interested in, rather than telling me more about health and the benefits of health, and then moving on to, wait, there's a spa that actually also does that, you know what I mean? So it's maybe one step that way. So this was more around the identifying the channel that you want to use? Yeah. yeah so the channel's great, yeah, yeah, but not the content. Not yeah. on the okay. content. Right. So the content could be so more educational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's about the channel. The sure. content is, of course, is the design, right? Like, you know, you yeah. want to target the audience based on the cities also. Yeah. And what are the top things, like, listed for many millions, and then you can yeah. come up with those images, the spa and all those kind of things. Yeah. So that will change based on the content. Is the channel that will work for these? Yeah. Maintenance is like, you know, office location yep. and the, like a metro and public transportation. So awesome. More Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's very, very good. Excellent. Uh, anybody else from awareness over the side there? And then we'll come back to you guys. So, do, oh, okay. Here, then there, then there. And then we're going to, okay. okay. Just a quick one. So we said in the end, this is all about the woman, so the girl, because I don't think the guy is going to look into this at all. Okay. <laughs> and he's also not going to spend money on So we're on targeting <laughs> uh, Sasha, yeah? <laughs> so we said um, it's going to be all about influencers on Instagram and right. like uh, what they are talking about on health, on how, but what they do at the moment and the trends that are happening at this moment, yep. because that's where she's going to look into. Okay, great. Good idea. Influencer is great. Okay, a couple more, one over to the side here. Hi, uh, what I feel is uh, relatability is very key, right? So the content needs to be really relatable. So we could probably list some problems, could be, you know, stuck in your nine to five every day. So make the best of your weekend, right? Yeah. So you connect them to a problem and then solve for it. Yes. Right. And uh, the kind of content could be very new age, like cinema graphs would attract attention. Yeah. Whatever the channel could be, right? So new uh, methods of graphic attention, I think would really also add to it. Yep. Very good. So I think I think 100% content it could be, you know, how to get better performance because these guys are professionals, right? We understand that they're professionals. So how can you get more performance in your day? How can so it doesn't talk about the health spas, but yeah. it's talking about how can you be a better you yeah, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Do we have one over over the side there? Good. Hi. Was the one there? 
So one quick one from there, and then I think one from you guys. Okay, hi. Um, right. We have a few ideas here. Uh, one of the more exciting ideas that's a bit different from other people that we have is we try to target um, this spa as a employee benefits for corporates. Right. So we work with travel partners, travel agencies to push this product um, into this agency to sell in bulk volume instead. Yep. So what happens is it's going to be um, more to letting them know um, what is this going to benefit for their company, uh, yep. what's the rela uh, relaxation and uh, um, engagement they can get uh, from corporates with their employees as well. Okay. All right. Interesting. So, so that approach is not going directly to the persona, but looking at a greater one. I still think perhaps it's probably more middle of the funnel because we're still talking about the product. Like this should not be talking about the product. This should not be about this. This is all about trying to engage them in the subject matter towards that. Yeah. Um, just quickly over here. Do we have one on that table? And then we're moving to consideration. So these are the awareness stuff. Then we're going to move to consideration. <laughs> one quick one. Here. What do you guys have? Out the box. <laughs> Uh, so I think the, uh, when we talk about the awareness stage, it is more about understanding the pain points of the customer. Yep. So I believe uh, uh, before we start, we have to uh, so do the surveys on the Q&A websites and all those stuff to g uh, get the pain points. And then I believe for an example, uh, when we talk about the spa business, like there can be a blog written about how stress can be managed, uh, first of all, or a yep. story on a video or something like that. And then I believe like that can be marketed to different channels, uh, uh, appropriate channels through uh, which we can market them uh, to the right people. So That's I believe perfect. it is uh, but, uh, it is most important is to understand the pain points, uh, then create a, a, a story out of, out of it, and yep. then to market the story right in front of the targeted audience uh, via blogs or videos, whatever uh, channels you have, or through the influencers as well. Sure. Fantastic, love it. Okay, let's move on to consideration. And that's really good because what you're, what you're targeting there is the type of stuff that, that uh, Sasha, if that's our target, would be searching for is how do I relieve stress? What products can help me you know, get through the day? And then all of a sudden we start to engage with them with content and then move them down to consideration. Um, for me, I play a little bit on like the stress things. The target is, I call it DINK. Double income, no kids, right. so they will spend for themselves, for the pleasure. And our engagement, the, the main idea is that um, pampering the day for the special night. The most ultimate moment going to happen when your body is fully relaxed. <laughs> that's okay. why they will so we're going really experience. emotive with that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's my good. idea. So, so we're <laughs> going to the, uh, the the late night marketing um, <laughs> channel, <laughs> the after hours. But it is true. There's no kids involved. Let's talk to them like adults. I love that. Very good. Okay. Anybody else from consideration before we move on to decision? Hopefully they've made a decision down there. Do we have one at the back? Yep. So I think maybe because it's located in an, an exotic place, I will have a, a virt virtual tour, like using yep. AR or VR uh, technology to have them to experience the spa uh, like yeah. in a real way. Yeah, very good. I think, I think one of the important things about that is, is it kind of like almost moving to decision because you're starting to show. But I think if you, if you use teaser type video where you're actually having teaser bits about here's an educational piece about how we relieve stress and it just happens to be shot in the actual destination of the thing. It's like one step towards the next level. But certainly I think that insight, that in inside kind of feel to it. Um, okay, let's move on to decision. Anyone want to go with decision? This is one step away from them paying $1,000 a night and an airfare. Okay. Down the front. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we engage? So we've got... We've got them watching late night TV or whatever it is they're doing in the evening to get the uh, excitement going, and now they're ready to decide. Okay, so I understand that we are on the page wherein they are next to clicking on a decision, right? Yeah. So we wanted to entice them to make their decision right away, not later on. They might find other advertisements for, for our competition, right? Yeah. And they might be diverted there. So um, I, we think that um, maybe we can entice them to make their decision right away by showing some um, 
like um, rewarding them if they make the decision now, like giving additional discounts or freebies if they book immediately. And um, also showing the consequences of them not booking immediately by probably showing a timer where it, it shows that as, the, as they delay their decision, the slots are um, dwindling or the slots are um, uh, being taken, taken yep. away from them. So um, if they delay their decision, they might just not, not be able to book anymore later on. Um, apart from that, we can also show a, um, that as the hours go by, the discounts or perks are decreasing. So, well, well that would entice them to, to make a decision right away. Sure. And if all else fails, we can let them know that we know their, where they live and we know their family. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, we know, and, and we know what they're watching and we're going to release that to the family. Exactly. They're, they're obviously doing that <laughs> stuff there. Um, the interesting thing is, so we, we'll probably stop there because I need to move on just before the end here, but what you've just <laughs> described there is the workflow that goes from the decision stage <laughs> to the opportunity <laughs> stage, right? So, so really, one of, we were talking before about the decision stage could be the fact that w why don't uh, why doesn't the spa kind of actually partner with a with an experience or a spa that's maybe in their local area because this this place is in an exotic location give them a taste of the real thing like it's a touch point right be able to partner with them and then once they enjoy whatever that that experience is the next thing is then to start the workflow to here's the coupons here's the enticement why don't you come and do the full experience it's the teaser before the full experience Okay, give yourselves a round of applause. That was exciting. <laughs> so guys, what we did there is basically looked at, this was one of the things from, from Inbound as well, which I wanted to share a couple of things with you. If we narrow the focus instead of broadening the market, it's easier to grow. This is about growing smarter, growing better. So if we think about narrowing it down, so we narrowed it down to one persona. Now, obviously for most businesses, you've got more than one persona. But if you did that exercise for every one of your key personas, and even, even start with two, start with your best fit customer, and then that future customer, that one we were talking about before. But work on what the engagement looks like. It wasn't that hard to do, but very much get your head in. How do I connect with them at awareness, consideration, decision stage? If you narrow your focus instead of broadening your market, it's a lot easier to grow. Um, Damesh Shah is one of the founders of HubSpot. He also shared with his keynote the idea of using this then type approach. And I really like this. And there was a couple of sessions I went to and spoke to a few people about how they do this. We try and be something to everyone rather than narrowing our focus and narrowing our market. So we use the example of Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably not, anyone know who Simon and Garfunkel is? Yeah, oh, that's good. <laughs> he's, a, he's an older sort of guy, so he didn't go for something really like this. But the idea of Simon and Garfunkel, two totally different people, but when you put them together in the middle, then they become Simon and Garfunkel, which is a band, you know, or, or, or an act, if you like, um, together. So we need to start thinking about, and I touched on this kind of a little bit yesterday, and this is an actual example that was given by um, a guy called Larry Kim. I don't know if you know Larry Kim from Mobile Monkey. Um, but he's, um, he shared this kind of e exact concept of using the Venn diagram. So say we want to target a particular audience, right? And the audience is massive. So let's say we find out that the, the kind of the, the, the trends of this audience or the interests of this audience or the, the kind of like getting very specific could be the fact that they, they're the type of people that would like Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Anybody know anything about Star Trek? Deep Space Nine, yeah? Oh, there's a couple there. So you recognize these characters. <laughs> so for the rest of you, this is Star Trek Deep Space Nine, right? But for those that know Star Trek Deep Space Nine, they would have watched this. So you could think of any program or type of interest that might be relevant to them. Okay, so these are the guys, so we do that on one side, and then we want to attack liberals, say, for example, on another side, which is a really broad kind of market. If we were just going to advertise to that market, it would be very, very big. But if we kind of lap that with also those that might be interested in deep space um, Star Trek, then we end up with this very narrow target. So this is what Larry Kim did. He did this as a kind of a target trial, and it sort of came out, and these were the results which were kind of interesting. So they actually had 1.3 thousand likes um, and 12, that's supposed to be 120,000 reach, right, with this particular test kind of campaign with something very, very specific. The engagement, because what he did was, because he'd now targeted liberals but targeted this Deep Space Nine, he, he could get some kind of GIF images and kind of like, you know, um, kind of some interesting um, imagery that would kind of 
make the ads look more engaging rather than a traditional thing. So we use some of that imagery as well to kind of engage. 235 shares, 68 comments, all of that for a $50 budget. You know, so straight away he's kind of like targeted and narrowed it down. So think about how you could maybe use the kind of the Venn approach to kind of think about like, here's my big market. I want to get to business people with a, you know, 20 person kind of business or whatever it might be. And then think about trialing some of this narrow stuff by thinking about different um, stuff that they might be interested in. Like we talked about yesterday, you know, uh, you know, Singapore and babies and things like that. There's things that people are interested in their real life that's outside of business. So how do we think about the buy persona and put those two things together? Can we have sound up? Does the TV only work when it's raining? Can a dog really carry a baby? Does the internet turn off at 7 every night? Can a goldfish run away? Is Santa always watching? It's a common misconception that... We're gonna rule the world, don't you know, don't you know? We are gonna rule the world, don't you know? Don't you know we're gonna put it together? We're gonna put it together. We're gonna put it together. We need to talk. So generation voices here. This is the next complexity that uh, I'm gonna share with you. Obviously, we haven't touched them out, but who's got one of these babies or, or a Google Home? Guys, you haven't lived until you've got one of these things. Like, this is great. Like, um, my, my wife doesn't like me having a relationship with um, Alexa on Amazon because, but I like it because everything I ask Amazon, she doesn't answer me back. She just delivers exactly what I want. Can you play me some music? Can you do whatever? But this voice activation thing is changing the way we market today. And that generation we talked about before, the alphas are all growing up in this world. So it's all going to be voice activated stuff. We're all having relationships now with our series, our Alexas and our Googles. Um, you know, because we're in our series, like we're actually talking to these people. So they reckon 50%, 50% of searches will be voice searches by next year as we start moving into 2020 and 2022. So you've got to think about, okay, how do we change? Because how we speak is different to how we type. So our searches that we're going to be doing or customers and prospects are going to be searching for us are going to be do doing a different sort of way. So we need to start thinking about how do we communicate on the kind of the voice platforms of tomorrow. So one of the things I want to share with you is really today we want to be a more of a connected brand. Okay, and I've kind of put it up. Here's our kind of Venn diagram thing again, which is fantastic. I love circles, by the way, if you haven't noticed. Um, brand engagement, buyer behavior, and growth automation. These are the three things I think you need to go away with, you know, and think about in your business today. And how we connect these two together is conversational marketing. So that approach of having this one-to-one -one conversation, understanding the context of where our buyers and our prospects are and having that conversation in real time and meaningful conversation is the brand engagement to the buyer behavior. It's understanding where the behavior is, what they're interested in and giving them more of our brand engagement. The next part is a thing called marketing automation. Like we have to automate as much as we can. We have to use the technology that's available to us now and I'll share with you some of that in a moment. But that's where we bring a growth stack. We bring our technology stack to play that helps us deliver real time 24 seven brand engagement. And then the last part is sales enablement, which is really where we're using again our growth stack, our sales kind of stuff, our sales team. So our sales team and our marketing team don't exist anymore by the way. We now have the marketing team. Okay, this marketing team is our sales and marketing team combined together. They need to work together as a revenue department of your business and they used to be using the same growth stack as the marketing team. You're all talking together. The customer doesn't care whether they're talking to marketing, sales or service. They're dealing with your brand and that's where sales enablement comes in. How does the sales team connect with the buyer based again by behavior? If they're at the awareness stage, we're not selling to them. If they're at the decision stage, we're starting the sales process. We're starting to move them to an opportunity stage. The other thing we need to think about is how content's changing. So this is um, a guy by the name of Phil who runs a company called Wistia. Anyone heard of Wistia? It's a, a video platform company like Vimeo. 
But the whole idea that Phil was talking about, and this was you know, at uh, Inbound, was we need to market like we're a media company. We need to start connecting with people like we're a media company. These guys have created this thing called Brand Wagon, which is a fantastic episodic kind of way of actually delivering their message to market. It's called Brand Affinity Marketing. So it's a way of actually connecting with our consumers across the whole buyer journey by engaging with them in a kind of a friendly, comical, kind of more, um, you know, conversational kind of way. From the creators of over 1,200 blog posts that aren't performing as well as they once were. And the team who's as tired of making quippy advertisements as they are of seeing them from the company that literally designed thousands of paid media assets that were uninspiring to work on and barely move the needle. And the marketers who know that the number of impressions does not equal the number of people impressed. Comes a brand new show with a brand new strategy in a brand new studio. Introducing Brandwagon. It's like a talk show, but for marketers. Hosted by Wistia's own CEO, Chris Savage. Join us as we learn from entrepreneurs and creative marketers who are investing in brand to grow their businesses. The way we build our brands has to change. So hop on the brand wagon and see where the future of marketing is headed. So if you get a chance, we're only up to like episode five or whatever, but it's really interesting to watch because the, these guys have started because they, they, they know video. They created a video platform. But what it is is um, the interesting thing is like our old way of measuring the tofu, mofu, and bofu is kind of changing now because we have to think about how we're going to measure something like interactive video. And I don't know if this is actually going to work. No, because there's a big black thing there. But basically what is up there behind the black screen is, is showing you that what we need to start measuring is the tofu part of something like that engagement is not about you know, how many leads we get. The tofu of that is how many subscribers we get. So how are we building our audience? So top of the funnel measurement is subscribers. This is how the guys have shared with me how they're measuring this right now. The middle of the funnel is basically measuring the time they spend. Right? So middle of the funnel, now you're starting to think about the metric is how long they spend watching the video. These videos last for maybe 30 minutes. It's like a TV show, like a late night TV show, 30 minutes. So how long do they start spending? So that shows their engagement level. And then the last one, the BOFU, is actually around SEO. Uh, what are they actually searching for? Are they searching for not just Bramwagon, but Wistia and the products and the services that we actually sell? So we need to start thinking about the metrics of what we're, we're actually kind of tracking now is not necessarily just about leads. It's about this whole thing about uh, brand engagement. And then, of course, there's artificial intelligence. I'm not going to show this video. I did want to show it to you, but check out the fourth revolution if you can. It's, uh, it was something that uh, is really changing the way we do things. And what it's doing is it's actually moving, the fourth revolution is moving marketing into the front seat. So if you're marketers today, you're in a fantastic position, right? Because marketing, there's, there's new kind of um, uh, job titles coming out called Data Wrangler, SEO Ninja, Chief Storyteller, all of this stuff is part of this next generation, this fourth generation we're going through. Um, and marketing needs to own three key things. There's three things that marketing needs to own, and that's brand, content, and causes. As I mentioned before, the causes, the impact on society and the environment are the things that we need to start managing. Um, and 50% like of the jobs they say by 2008 will be replaced by artificial intelligence. We need to make sure we're working closely with artificial intelligence um, and making sure that works. 100 million hours of videos are watched every day on what platform? Facebook. So again, we're watching video on different types of platforms, not on the, on, the, on the platforms where we kind of think. Video is everywhere. So if you're not doing video, you need to start doing video. People love the connection with video, but you need to be using video on platforms like Wistia, HubSpot, or whatever, so you can track the engagement that people do. Because digital is becoming more like television, and television is becoming more like digital. Um, I think I'm just going to show you this very quick. Um, has everyone seen? Everyone's got Netflix? Yeah, anyone watch the new Bear Grylls interactive thing? Just watch this very quickly. Uh, volume, please. It's up to you. We've got two options of what to do here. Either step really tentatively or crawl like a seal. If you're on this journey with me, you decide.
So interactive television. It's amazing, and I don't know if you get a chance to have a look at this on Netflix, but you choose your adventure. Remember the old choose your own adventure stories that you used to do as kids? Well, this is actually now becoming more of our life, that digital is moving into that kind of area. So let's start thinking about how we connect. These are some of the things that you, to finish up with that you need to be thinking about. We need to be having conversations with people on the platform of their choice, right? So you need software and platforms like this, so we're talking to people on whatever conversation platform they want. We need to be granular about our segmentation, understand who our personas are, talk to them one-to-one -one so we know that they are the, the sashes of this world and that they're interested in this and understand more about our personas and what they're interested in. We need to personalize the experience like the website I showed you before. How do we personalize that experience so it becomes a one-to-one -one experience. We need to use things like predictive lead scoring and having a look at once we get a great customer, have a look at how they came to us as a journey and use the science of that to go back into a database and pull out people that match that same criteria. That's called predictive lead scoring and it's exciting. We need to look at our reporting from an advanced level. Constantly, whatever department you're in, look at the marketing reporting and the sales reporting and see how people are interacting. A B test. Like it's 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 should be done all the time. Like keep testing. A slight word change here can make a big difference to the engagement of a landing page. Your website needs to sit on a platform that's on the same platform as your marketing so that you can really personalize, like the ResMed experience I gave you. You can personalize the experience. Don't just make the website a cold, dark place that sits there and doesn't engage. We want to make that come to life and start engaging with people. We need to make it easy for people to book meetings with our sales team. When they're ready to buy from us, it's got to be frictionless. I've got to be able to buy number one, like click, like an Amazon and book a meeting. We need to help our sales team also follow our brand voice by having templates and sequences and automate the process of sales so they can just press a button and the nurturing, like we were talking about before, can continue to send coupons and emails out so they don't have to sit there day in and day out typing the same email. We can replicate some of that stuff by using templates and sequences. And then we need to, to track the deals, so I track where things are. Where do people sit right now? You know, they could be right up in the buyer journey and not be buying from us for three months, but we need to keep front of mind with these people and track as they go. Put all that into a marketing canvas. One page or a few pages, everything that kind of shows the engagement between everything from attracting visitors to capturing leads to acquiring customers to creating promoters. And that's the delight stage of everything that we need to do. It's creating this flywheel. I mentioned it yesterday. It's a seamless spinning wheel that we constantly are engaging with our customers and our prospects. So they keep coming back for more. The faster the wheel spins, the more energy creates, and the better we grow and we grow smarter at the same time. Um, that was a very quick way to finish because I know it's drinks time. I know you're super excited to keep going, but we're going to have drinks. Um, sorry I couldn't make this kind of URL a little bit more user-friendly. <laughs> that kind of URL is very much full of friction, so it completely defeats the whole presentation. But take a picture of it. If not, email me, Tony at sortedstone.com. Uh, and I'll send you the link. This is a, a inbound marketing strategy template pack that we've created that you guys can download. It's got buy persona stuff in there. It's got a uh, lead scoring model. It's got some content campaign overview. It's all for free, some SEO back press, uh, practices checklist, a good starting point for you on inbound marketing. Um, that's me out of breath and ready for a drink. Thank you. <laughs>